Hello, everybody. Welcome again to English Champion. On this episode, I want to share、um, some insight into some books I read recently. One good book, one really, really bad book, as I'll explain.、Um, and、uh, hopefully, you find some of the ideas、uh, interesting and worth thinking about. The good book that I read just this past week、uh, is by Mark Bauerlein,、um, called The Dumbest Generation Grows Up. And it's a sequel to his 2008. Book that was quite successful uh, about um, young people, mostly, most, it's mostly about college students, I would say, but he kind of extends it to anyone under the age of 30, pretty much.、Um, but it's a very good book、um, about the progress of our culture and、um, how these young people have gotten to be the way they are. And、uh, I'm going to give you some <laughs> thoughts about that here as we go. One、um, portion of the book. That、um, really highlights the connection to the other book I'm going to discuss here is、uh, Bauerlein was talking to one of his students、um, amid some of the big、um, dust ups and um, um, arguments that were going on and the, the controversies、uh, on college campuses. And he asked this, this young lady, he, he asks, Why are people so. Angry. Why, why is everyone so upset? And he said, The young lady answered with one very simple line. She said, Everyone deserves to be happy. And she said it in a way, he describes, that seemed so obvious that it didn't require further explanation. That to her, this was just such a great idea that it was automatically true and should be accepted. And so he describes、uh, afterward when he started thinking about it how what a really bad idea that, that is because there's all sorts of situations where、um, people don't deserve to be happy. If, if, if you're acting badly, then uh, uh, you might deserve some bad consequences. So、um, the generation has, in part of the book, he describes that the generation has really been defined by their ability to take an idea and reduce it down to the most simplistic. Vapid, naive, cliched platitude, and,、um, and use that as like a, a mantra, like life advice or something. And、uh, so that, that's one critique that he has of the book, and that ends up showing up pretty clearly, really, in the second book that I, I want to talk about, and that is、uh, The Tyranny of Merit by a very famous Harvard professor, Michael Sandel. And What he does is really, really awful, as I'll, as I'll describe.、Um, and it really reminds me of what happens in literary theory in, in my field. He does to sort of philosophy and politics and economics. Here, what,、uh, what often happens in the literary field, which is、um, there's a nugget of truth in a, in a claim. And、basically, what a lot of literary theorists do is they take that little piece of truth that's actually real, that goes on in the real world, and they basically take that idea and drive it off a cliff. They just, they just ruin it、um, because they go to such an extreme that it becomes really absurd once you, once you think about it. They think it's great insight and they get applauded and they write these articles and appear at these conferences, and everyone says, Oh, yes, that's so smart. When really, no, that. That's really, really bad ideas. And so, part of what my mission is as, as an English professor is to try to rescue those literary theories and bring some reality back to them because they've gone so far off the rails. And so, that's what Sandel does here is he takes something that has pieces of a good idea and takes them to a level that is really, really dumb. And、uh, I'm going I'm to break that down for you.、Um, I'm not exaggerating when I say if one of my undergraduate research writing students would bring this as an essay to me in class,、um, I would destroy it because it's, so, it's filled with such illogical arguments, such flimsy thinking, such lack of understanding of, of human beings that I would, I would never let a student make this argument.、Um, I, would, I would expect much more rigor. Um, and Sandel, for as smart as he is, just completely he doesn't get it. I don't know why.、Um, I'm going to make the argument here in a bit that I think he's just so bound by his 
um, ideology that he can't see anything else. So I'm going to try to explain some things he should have noticed when he was writing this book. To be fair, let me let me try to offer some of the good parts of his book, again called The Tyranny of Merit. In it, he argues that, you know, this idea of meritocracy, that we always have to be striving towards success and status, is actually a really bad thing, and we need to change our outlook um, in order to develop more um, civic cohesion, that we, we can strengthen our communities and our country by not being so obsessed with success and status. Um, and again, there is potentially a kernel of truth in there. You know, he has a, a fair amount of criticism for people he calls elites, and I would completely agree with that. These tend to be people who um, think they know everything, you know, because they went to special schools, they have advanced degrees, and so they basically think they can tell others how to live, and, and that is a problem for sure. Um, this leads to another topic that he talks a lot about for the first oh, 50 pages, and then he sprinkles it throughout, which is this technocratic mindset in government that, well, if we just get the smartest people who went to the smart, the best schools, if we just put them in place, then they can kind of organize our society in a way that everyone can be better off and we'll all be happy. And really, you know, government and, and organizing our society is really just a big math equation. We just need to have smart people organizing it for us and, and that'll solve all our problems. And so he, he really does criticize that. There's an ironic twist to that, uh, as I'll explain here in a minute. But I agree. Technocrats are really bad for governing. Um, he's also right that elite education is overvalued. Very true. We give way too much um, credit to you know, the name you have on your diploma. Um, that doesn't determine your worth as a person. Um, you can get educated elsewhere for a lot cheaper and probably a lot better, frankly. Um, the idea that um, you have to graduate from certain schools leads to the, the idea of credentialism, that you have to have um, certain um, signals of your achievement, right? Um, and that's how we determine how valuable, valuable you are in the marketplace. Uh, I agree, that is a problem. Um, he talks about respecting labor, all types of labor, especially you know, more, you might call it blue-collar labor. labor. Completely agree. Um, folks who do those jobs, if, if they're doing their jobs well and and uh, um, and they are giving their best effort, yeah, we they deserve respect. Obviously, um, that we shouldn't demean people of any class. You know, he he uh, says a lot of elites um, they use their status to kind of look down on on people in those other types of careers, and yeah, that's not okay. Um, people shouldn't be doing that. Um, like I kind of just mentioned, he is against attributing moral worth based on how much money they earn or what type of um, position they've acquired in the culture. Um, I'm not really sure who he thinks that is. I I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think that Bill Gates is a more moral person than I am because he has a higher status or income than I do, nor do I think the janitor at my school is uh, ha is less of a moral person because I make more than he does. I, I don't understand how he's equating morality uh, with this. If someone does that, then he's right. Everyone, you know, that's, that's not good. Um, we shouldn't be comparing people in that way, but um, I'm not, I'm not sure who he thinks does that exactly. And he also makes the claim that, you know, we should, not take meritocracy so seriously because a lot of our position in life is due to some element of luck. And in some ways, that is quite accurate. We, Some of us would agree with pieces of that. He way over um, represents luck as a, as a contributing factor. I, I don't as much, but it is a factor for sure. So there are a number of ideas that he says that sort of makes sense. I actually agree with them in part. Um, and uh, so there are some ideas worth worth taking seriously here. 
However, there are lots and lots of problems here. One of them is in how he defines terms. He he speaks a lot about morality, and again, he's a philosopher and tries to understand what the good would be and how people behave and all that, but he never really defines it. Well, I don't know what he thinks is moral exactly. He just throws it out and expects people to agree with his his understanding of it, but I don't fully know how he came to that judgment. And so I'm willing to listen, but you got to explain to me how you decided what you think moral is. He does the same thing with success. I, I don't know what he thinks success is. Um, you know, someone might think success is making a million dollars. Someone might think success is making $50,000. I, I mean, success is relative, <laughs> you know, depending on who you are and what your values are. I don't know what that is. So when he kind of uses these blanket terms like success or he does the same thing with wealth, um, uh, I don't exactly know what he's referencing. I can kind of guess, but I'd prefer if he just told me, here's the threshold for these ideas. Um, it's just, again, it's bad writing, it's bad logic when you don't define your terms. That's one thing I constantly tell my students. You better tell me exactly what you mean by that word. Um, he also, as a philosopher, this is like an unforgivable mistake, really. He, he really um, makes David Hume's famous error of uh, the is-ought problem. Um, as I'll explain here, he takes things that are is circumstances in the culture, things things that we can see that's actually going on, that is accurate. And then he somehow lands on an ought without telling us how he did it. And that was David Hume's problem. He identified it, and even Hume couldn't really get out of his own problem. Uh, if you read his work, he kind of makes the same mistake. So if you're going to jump from how something is to making a moral claim about it, a judgment on how things should be or ought to be, well, you got to be very careful. And at minimum, you have to explain how you got there. Sandel never does. He basically just says, here's how things are. Here's how things should be because that would be better. Like, well, why? Why would you assume that? Give me a reason for it. He doesn't. So um, you've got to justify your arguments, and you can't make the is-ought leap without at least trying to explain yourself. So one of the premises he begins from is that inequality is bad. <laughs> okay, there's an is statement. We have inequality. Sure, that's no one would disagree with that. We have inequality in all sorts of ways of life. And he jumps to, well, that's not a good thing without telling us why he thinks that. So, again, if we take another, he's talking about money and, and wealth and success. But if you take that from another example, that's like, it's like saying there are some people who are six foot five and there are some people who are five foot five. And that inequality of height is unfair. Well, why? Why are you saying that something that is an is has a moral problem with it. Explain it to me. So he he never does. He just assumes that we should all agree that any level of inequality, um, financially or status or otherwise, is bad. Well, I I can't I can't start to agree with you unless you tell me why you think that. So uh, you know there's no automatic correlation between height and inequality. There's no any uh, automatic correlation between money and inequality. It just is. If you're going to make an ought claim, a claim about it, you better defend it. So throughout the book, he also argues for why um, we've, we've sort of seen this surge of populism in recent years, um, whether it's with some of the protests, whether it's with the election of certain um, people in government, um, and he, he claims that part of the problem or, or part of the reason that populism has emerged is because of the problem of meritocracy, that um, we've placed such a high premium on people achieving these levels of status that anyone who doesn't achieve it feels like they're being left behind, and so they're very upset about it. And to make matters worse, the people who have made it um, demean those at the lower end, and so, um, you know... People at the bottom feel unappreciated, and so that's why they're showing their outrage and electing the people they are, because they're looking for anyone who will 
side with them and, and act like they support them. It's like, well, um, I don't think that's why the populist um, um, idea has been flourishing lately. Uh, let me just give you an example. Michael Jordan, as a basketball player, and outside of basketball, but as an as just a basketball player, earned way, way more money when he played than any of his fellow NBA players. It was way unequal. Even though they're all millionaires, he made so much more money than everyone. It's amazing. And you know what? His fellow players, his competitors who thought who you would think would be most mad about him making that much money, they didn't care. They knew he was the best. And so they're like, yeah, he deserves it. And the billions of fans around the world who still to this day adore Michael Jordan and, and love watching him play and screamed his name and followed him everywhere, who would never even make a tiny fraction of the money he made as an athlete. They didn't care either. It's not about the inequality that makes people upset. When people are excellent, no one minds for the most part. When it seems, when the rewards that people earn are due to excellence, there's not a problem. People get mad when they see people doing illegal things and then not getting punished. You can, I'll let you consider how that occurs currently in our, <laughs> in our culture, where high profile people seem to be doing pretty shady or even outright illegal things. And no one seems to care. They get a pass, weirdly. People get mad because of nepotism. Again, it's like a, it's an unearned privilege. Uh, they get mad because of incompetence. Right? Back to kind of an, an athlete thing. Again, no one, no one criticizes or no one gets that mad when uh, an athlete gets signed to a new contract and they're making you know, $10 million a year. What happened? Why do fans start booing and getting mad at that player when they start being incompetent? Because it shows they haven't earned their money that, they, that they're making in such an extravagant way. So incompetence causes people to be upset. And that's what's happening too. They see our leaders as being incompetent. And so they're starting to rise up. And, and that's where the populism comes from. They also see the government showing favor to certain people over others. When you know, things, you know justice is supposed to be blind. You should treat everyone the same. And yet the, the government... Um, comes in and bails out the banks back after 2008, yet um, any other small business, if they run their business into the ground and go bankrupt, they wouldn't get bailed out. So people get upset about that. So we just saw this with all the COVID rules. Like, oh, uh, you make us follow all these rules. You shut our, uh, uh, our communities and our cities and our businesses down. And yet you guys all get to go out and have fun and eat at fancy restaurants and go to go to ball games and not have to wear masks. And that's what makes people upset. So it's not that in inequality inherently makes people mad. It's unearned inequality. It's um, extravagant, in your face, unworthy <laughs> inequality. That's what makes people tend to be pretty upset. So what Sandel kind of seems to forget is this regarding the idea of meritocracy, that everyone, this is what I've been writing about in some of my other places, everyone acts with an aim toward improvement, or as John Locke calls, removing uneasiness, right? We, the only reason we do something is because we anticipate that our action will lead to something better. It's why I get off the couch and go to, when I'm hungry, I have uneasiness because of my hunger, and I go to the fridge, and I get a snack to remove my uneasiness. The action I took of deciding to get off the couch and go to my fridge was on purpose and was intended to achieve a goal. We also have to at least believe, even if it's not quite accurate, we have to believe that what we do has a causal relationship with the outcome. We have to believe that. Otherwise, I would never know what to do. And basically, if, if you don't know what to do, you're, you're essentially just living your life by trial and error. You're going to just try stuff and you know, you're going to die very quickly if you rely on trying to feed yourself 
based on just trial and error. You have to know that the choices you make are going to work. And again, we don't always do that perfectly. That's why that's how like superstitions come up and uh, oh, we won today because I wore these special socks. Well, you're you're building a causal relationship that isn't actually accurate. But for most of our life, we have to know that what we do will lead to something. And that something is going to be positive. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. So the fact that he doesn't really understand how meritocracy is kind of a natural evolution of action to causal relationships to continued improvement. That's what meritocracy is. And um, it's like he doesn't acknowledge it. And so... Um, the really disappointing thing here is that this is human nature. We have to be this way. And the idea of merit is found in the earliest of animals, <laughs> like the lowest, you know, like way beyond mammals. The lowest levels of animals have some version of meritocracy. Um, and if, if you're not comfortable with like cross species evolution, if you just want to talk about humans, the earliest humans, there's really interesting theories about how even how we developed language itself was to hold other people accountable. Like we didn't develop speaking for really any other reason other than to share social information so that we can one help each other, but also ferret out imposters and people who are cheating and lying and stealing, and also free riders. Because again, inherently we don't like when people are at the top of the, the status you know, chain or whatever, they've earned merit, meritocracy or they, they've achieved meritocracy, but we know they haven't earned it. Right? It's like they're stealing from the group. Right? We also don't like the other end of the spectrum where people are, are mooching, they're free riding. They're getting the benefits of the group without actually contributing, contributing anything. We know that's not fair. And so... There's, there's theories. Read, read Robin Dunbar, read William Flesh. Um, these guys talk about how in our earliest ancestors, the very feature of in humans of language was really meant to judge meritocracy. Who deserves what? Who should be punished? Who, who is doing a good job in the group? That's why we are the way we are. So, um, you know, again, it's it's like he doesn't quite either he doesn't know or he just wants to ignore um, these very basic fundamental things about human nature, um, and it's a shame because he's a smart guy and yet it, it makes him look like he's not very smart. Um, he also he makes a lot of sweeping claims and generalizations. He does something that I yell at my students about all the time. He he uses we and our all the time, and I'm like I don't know who we is. We do this. We we look down on people below us. I'm like, well, I don't do that. So who are you talking about exactly? You better be very specific when you make these broad generalizations about people. Uh, he uses the word society. Yeah, it's a word that's basically a no-no in my class. I, I don't know who society is. So he says, you know, we need to, uh, society needs to take these steps. Like, who is that exactly? I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So the idea of who's he trying to address here, he, he, demonstrates that he's trying to address everyone from all sides of various belief systems and political alignments, which I, I credit him for. But when you think about these concepts he's talking about, generally speaking, the things he's describing is really a problem predominantly for only one of our political affiliations um, as opposed to the other. You know, I'll just let you consider... Who's the party that thinks everyone has to go to college? There's one party that tends to think that. It's the other party that says, no, nope. uh, trade schools, alternative forms of education, work, blue-collar labor is really important. Um, only one party really pushes the idea that everyone has to go to college. One party wants to intervene as technocrats in everyone's life and manipulate our social systems and economic systems so that they can achieve the results they want. That's one party. The other party, at least the other party who, if, if they stick to their actual beliefs, they tend to stay out of things. They want you to make your own choices. They don't, they don't intervene and, and um, manipulate people the way that the other party does. Uh, one party particularly seems to self-segregate. We just saw 
problems that come up uh, <laughs> this past week. Segregate from lower classes. Um, who lives in Martha's Vineyard exactly? Who lives in Malibu and the Hamptons and Aspen? Those are all one party towns. So I'll let you decide who exactly it has the meritocracy problem and, and the looking down on the lower classes problem. So you know, that's something I wish he would really just, he does it, he, he does it pretty well, but he would be making a much stronger argument if he would just call out these people and say, look, you're part of the problem. You've got to fix this. Um, but he doesn't. He, he's just, uh, he can't resist falling into his ideology. He also commits a, a logic problem because he, he starts from the premise that, I guess, America or the West or I'm not sure exactly, whoever kind of set up, quote unquote, this system. Um, and so we just need to change the system. Like, like we just started meritocracy 50 years ago or something, right? <laughs> um, he also does this with uh, the idea of, of good fortune when he talks about luck. Um, he makes the argument that, well, people are lucky enough to live in a place and time where their unique talents happen to be um, you know, valued by the marketplace. It's like, uh, maybe that's not luck exactly. Um, our ability to participate in it, yes, that's fortunate because, you know, I could have been born in, you know, a gulag, you know, somewhere in China or Russia or whatever. Uh, I could have been born in sub-Saharan Africa or the jungles of the Amazon where, you know, some of these opportunities didn't exist. Yeah, that, that is pretty lucky. I, we all, we all agree on that. But the fact that those things exist in this place and time, that, that's not luck. <laughs> those things are accumulated. Um, over time and over across, uh, over time and across diverse populations, um, you know, maybe things are the way they are because they were the best option available. We can we can certainly debate whether those should be um, available and whether they should be something that people pay sometimes exorbitant amounts of money for. But that that's a different question. He seems to not quite grasp that culture is evolutionary and the way things are is because. Again, we may not agree with it, but because they, in some sense, work. Like all things evolutionary, if they didn't work, they would die out. So it's very strange. He, he sort of, you know, if there's a, a, a spectrum of where his argument could land and, and, and uh, where his starting premise could be, it's like he kind of starts in the middle and then just assumes that that's how it began. It's like, no... Go back to the beginning and find out how human nature actually works and how we got to this place, and then maybe you could make a stronger argument. Um, you know, it's kind of like he's like a lot of people in his position, elites uh, who have these ideas. It's like he's sitting on the top branch of this giant, you know, domestic, uh, majestic tree, and he's unwittingly like trying to saw the trunk uh, of the of the big tree. Um, the fact is. For him to even be able to make an argument about meritocracy, he had to have benefited from a system of meritocracy. Right? Otherwise, why would anyone listen to him? Well, it's because he's a Harvard professor. It's because he's published a bunch of books. He's famous. That's why people listen to him. So um, he's simultaneously um, criticizing the very thing that he is immersed in, which I'll get to a little more strongly here in one minute. Um, as I said, he, he makes some good points regarding the education system. Um, I tend to agree with, with some of it. He also, though, again, makes some really serious logic errors here. He, he describes a number of times the link between wealth and educational success. He gives some stats about how um, scores on SATs are actually more correlated to uh, the wealth of the student's background than it is even to their grades or other forms of measuring their intelligence. Um, this is kind of like the the books in the house argument you hear a lot, which is, um, you know, one factor that determines academic success is how many books are in the home. So the argument would go, well, by people like Sandel, is that, well, since uh, those people are wealthy enough to have books in the home, 
obviously the kids have access to reading material and so they can learn more and uh, you know they can become successful at school. Again, he's starting the argument in the middle. He just assumes that people have wealth to start with. <laughs> like, how about the causal arrow actually probably goes the other direction? or at least starts from an earlier place, which is the people who have the wealth to buy books are the certain type of people who figured out a way to achieve that wealth in the first place, which then led them to buy books, which then led them to educate their children. You had to start with the people first, not the wealth. People create wealth. Wealth only afterwards could you argue creates you know how people turn out but the wealth had to come from somewhere again people like him sort of assume that everyone or that, that certain people automatically have it and again i wish people would really study economics more because it's quite clear <laughs> that the vast majority of people who have wealth again whatever that definition is sandel never clearly defines it but who have wealth didn't just fall into it they didn't um, grow up with it. You know, the numbers are somewhere between 80 to 90%, depending on how wealth is measured, grew up as working or middle-class people. They're just regular people. And they, through various efforts um, and acquisition of skills and all sorts of things, became wealthy. Only 10 to 20% are generational wealth, where, yeah, their grandfather owned a major company and it got passed down and the grandkid is a bazillionaire already and doesn't have to do anything and has all those advantages. Yeah, that happens, of course, but that is a pretty small number. Um, most people had to do things to earn wealth, and it's those people who know how to do stuff that then train their kids to do stuff, and those are the kids who become successful. So he's, he's, mis un he's misinterpreting some statistics here, and again, he's not quite understanding where the causation is coming from. Um, you know, I did an experiment a long time ago um, because I wanted to test this idea with some of my students because this was about 12 or 14 years ago when the spread the wealth around kind of thing was really kicking off and it's only gotten worse since then. Uh, I was like, okay, well, here's what my kids are talking about. Let, let me see if they really believe it. And so I, I went to these great lengths to craft this really official looking letter from the school. I put it on letterhead and I made it this really professional looking thing that looked like it came from our uh, from our school's administration. I did this back at a uh, community college I used to work at. And uh, I showed it on the screen one day. I said, you know, I, I just got an email from our administrators and, and this was the policy that was handed down. And I described how we were no longer going to um, let students have A's. Um, if you got an A on a paper, basically uh, our policy was now going to take the points that gave you the A and redistribute them to those who got uh, low grades. And so that basically everyone would end up with a C and, um, and that's what would go on your transcript. And, and you should be okay with that because um, after all you passed, so it's not harming you. And, um, and you're, you're contributing to the greater good of the, of the class and our, our community at our school because uh, you know, your points are going to go help other people who are more needy than you are. You know, you're lucky because you're really smart or uh, you, you happen to do well on this one. So um, we need to redistribute some of those things to some of the other students. And my students lost it. They freaked out. So even the kids who thought, yeah, you know what? Things are a little unfair. We should redistribute. When I gave them the opportunity to redistribute and reduce the meritocracy, they wanted no part of it. So, um, you know, they were demanding, like, there's no way this this can't be real. We can't do that. You know, when I when I write a paper, I, I, I deserve the grade I get. And all this is going to do is cause people to not want to work. It's like, well, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> so even my freshman community college students who barely knew anything, um, they knew it. That's accurate. When you try to reduce meritocracy, you're going to get... Um, laziness and a revolt because people have an inherent need to see that what they're doing actually produces um, something of worth. Otherwise, why would you do anything? Um, but again, people like uh, Sandel and, and uh, 
other elites, um, they only they only view things through the lens of money. So whether it's school or whether it's a, in, in the workforce, um, money is really what what they're caring about more than anything. Um, they ask a lot about how you know they really only care how much money do you have and how does that amount compare uh, to someone else's amount. You know, it's always I got to compare to other people rather than being content or either content with what you've got or using it as motivation to strive for something better, it's, uh, I, I need to know what someone else has, otherwise I'm going to be unhappy. Um, and what he does when it comes to the real working world is he's ignoring that people are compensated in a variety of other ways. It's not just in your bank account. It's not just in the, the money on your paycheck. Um, he gives the stat, which again, a lot of people do, of um, wages have been stagnant since the 70s and um, you know, that's a big problem because um, that means people are getting basically poorer today uh, than even they were in the 70s. Um, and you know, that's not good because, you know, things are expensive and all that. It's like, okay, maybe that's true as far as a, a sheer statistical standpoint. You go find me, anybody who is willing, if they had a time machine, that they would rather go back and live in the 1970s as opposed to the 2020s. Find someone who says, yeah, you know what? That would that would have been a better place. I would have been earning, you know, relatively speaking, slightly more, which means my purchasing power would have probably been better, and, and that would have been a better world to live in. Find me one person who would agree with that. Now, there might be some old people who might be okay with that, but find me anyone under the age of 40, and especially under the age of 25, you're going to tell some 22-year-old kid who just graduated, and you're, you know, you're feeding him with how difficult life is and how, you know, unfair the world is and all this stuff. And you're telling him, you know what, your wages are going to be so low; they're they're the same as they were almost 50 years ago. Things haven't gotten better. And if you said, "Would you rather go live back then?" Oh, and by the way, that means no internet, no social media, no thousand channels of television programming to watch. Uh, yeah, there was pizza delivery, but there was no DoorDash app. There was no anything <laughs> anything fun that you like now didn't exist. Yeah, no one would do that. So when we talk about income or even wealth or you know just life satisfaction, these folks, they find it very convenient to go look at salary as their only determining factor when even poor people today have an iPhone. Even I don't have an iPhone. They're too expensive. And I make good, de- you know, I make decent money. It's like, I don't want to pay for that. And yet I see poor people every day with iPhones. I see poor people every day with $200 pairs of sneakers. Like, well, I can't afford those sneakers. So, you know, clearly someone's got some money somewhere, right? It's because we have the ability to purchase things that do make our lives more convenient or just more enjoyable. Even if our paycheck is stagnant, we still have access to all sorts of things that no one in human history had access to. That's the trade-off. Yeah, we have a little bit less in our bank account, but look at all the cool stuff I can get. Well, people don't. People like Sandel don't think about that. Again, if you don't study economics very much, these are the traps you fall into. Your logic really falls apart. And as far as jobs go, it's not just your paycheck. It's about what what your paycheck represents. You know, he. He talks in the book about valuing labor, and I I agree with that. But ultimately, we value production, not just labor. You can labor all you want at something that doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean you should get paid for it. We need you to produce things. Um, That's how you show that you're contributing. Um, You know, I give the examples in class sometimes, or I've written about it in places where you know, if a student hands in a paper, he's been working 12 hours a day for a week straight writing this paper. And I've got this other kid who writes a paper the night before at midnight in one sitting, and they turn him in in class the next day. Well, which paper should I give a higher grade to? If you believe labor is the most important thing, then you, I guess you'd give the higher grade, regardless of what the paper looks like, to the kid who spent 12 hours a day for a whole week working on it. After all, by that definition, he quote unquote worked harder, right? But that's not how we assess papers or anything else that people produce. We assess it based on how good it is. And so in my classes, 
yeah, I hope you work hard, but really all I care about is, is, is if it's good when you hand it in. If you work hard and you're like, yeah, man, I spent 12 hours a day working. I was typing all the time and researching and I really gave it my best effort and I read it and there's 30 spelling errors in it. And the other kid who was able to sit down and crank it out in one evening uh, in a couple hours and hands it in and it's perfect. Like, well, the second kid's getting a higher grade. It's just the way it is because <laughs> because I need good work. I need you to produce something that's quality. So it's not about how much work you put into it. It's about can you do it? You have to be good at something. By the way, this is a movement that universities are pursuing. So if you're a parent or a student out there, especially if you're a parent, uh, keep your eye out for this. There are teachers now who are grading that way where they'll say, well, how long did it take you to write the paper? And they go, well, it took me, it took me two weeks. Oh, you get an A. Like that's a real thing. Uh, I'm not making that up. Um, it's called the, it's called labor-based assessment. And it's basically grading people not on what they do and how good they are at, at the skill. It's about, well, how much time did you spend doing it? How, how hard quote unquote, did you try? That's, that's how they determine grades. So you got to be very careful. Um, if you want your students to actually learn things, you might want to avoid those schools because after all, uh, it doesn't matter how many hours you spent on those math problems. If you can't do math, um, you shouldn't get a high grade for it. So be aware of, uh, of um, labor-based assessment or rewards or compensation only based on labor. It's also, again, understanding what work actually is. People are, are paid based on how difficult a job is, not how important it is. Um, he references in the book Martin Luther King who, who described how valuable uh, sanitation workers are because after all, um, yeah, we doctors are important, but if sanitation workers didn't take out the garbage and keep our streets clean, then germs and disease would spread, which would um, basically overrun doctors anyway. And so Doctors can only do their jobs because sanitation workers do their jobs. It's like, well, oh, yeah, again, there's that kernel of truth. But are you really saying that's how we should pay people? Because that's not what happens, right? Um, and the reason why is uh, being a cardiovascular surgeon is way more difficult than being a garbage man. That's just the way it is, and that's why he gets paid more. There's a nearly unending number <laughs> of people who could be qualified within an hour to be garbage men. There are only, you know, a relative few who after even 10 years of study could become a thoracic surgeon or, you know, any job that requires an immense amount of knowledge and skill, an NFL quarterback or an astronaut or whatever uh, high status position that requires a lot of skill and knowledge, um, those are the people who get the status or the paycheck. So yeah, thinking that labor is the most important thing or that um, even how important your job is to the culture, that's, that's just not, <laughs> it's not how it works. Um, there's an interesting anecdote. I think it was the San Francisco 49ers. I think when Bill Walsh was the coach there in the 1980s, um, he implemented uh, an atmosphere in the organization of, or, or either he did or the owner did, I can't remember, of kind of uh, this dignity for all levels of employees, which I think was a, was a good idea. And so basically what he did is, is they included um, all levels of employees, from the owner all the way down to the secretaries and, and maintenance men and all, that, all, all the different types of jobs. They could all be a part of the meetings uh, the corporate meetings and the, you know, they could all offer ideas on improvement for the company and all of that. Um, and so it really did uh, create a, an environment of respect. But let's not think for one second that the secretary at the front desk, <laughs> when you walk into San Francisco 49er headquarters, was being paid the same as Joe Montana and Jerry Rice. Why? Because what Joe Montana and Jerry Rice do is very, very difficult to do. And uh, that's why they get paid more. So when uh, Sandel talks in his book quite extensively about we need to build in esteem and respect and recognition for laborers, um, again, we're on the path to agreement. 
um, because those are really valuable things. Yeah, okay, yeah, we, we should respect people, got it. Yet, guarantee you he and people like him would still be complaining that, well, the person at the top is still making you know, a lot more money than the person at the bottom, and that's unfair. So even though they claim that respect is really, and, and esteem and recognition are really the most important things for people's kind of well-being, um, they would still keep beating the drum that, oh, things aren't fair because look at their paychecks. So um, it's never enough with folks like him. It's, uh, it's always about money. The thing that is very frustrating that Sandel, and again, people like him, would, would never admit and I'm not intending to make this religious or, or political, but I have to just give you the facts <laughs> as they are because there's a mountain of evidence that supports this. But frankly, conservatism and particularly Christian conservatism are the answer to this problem that he is complaining about. The idea that meritocracy is bad is actually something that conservatives and again, particularly religious conservatives actually already try to do because those are people who um, if they're actually living out their faith and their principles um, they are living out the ideas of, of humility that um, yeah I know that I am very lucky and that yeah I've worked hard but it wasn't all me other people have helped me along the way uh, I've been lucky in some situations yeah I I, tr I get that I, I understand that's what that's that is how they feel. Um, the idea of respect for other people, again, um, as, a, as a religious person, you would be taught to, to value the moral worth of people and not look down on people, not demean them for whatever job they have. Um, the idea of personal responsibility. You know, everyone's responsible. We all have to, we all have to chip in. We all have to participate. Um, promoting blue-collar work instead of everyone having to go to college. This is, these are things conservatives promote. And perhaps most importantly of all, the idea of charity. Christians and conservatives donate more to charity than anyone else, by far. They volunteer to help people in need more than anyone else, by far. So when you're asking for people to have this increased level of respect and recognition for you know, the disparities that truly do exist, well, a lot of Christians and conservatives already do that. They're the ones already trying to solve your problem. And yet, frankly, you're, you and people like you, Mr. Sandell, are, are probably criticizing them most of all when they're the ones actually trying to help voluntarily because they do, they do see the problems with that. And they take the proactive initiative to actually try to help. And yet, the people you align with actually don't. So that's the real problem. I wish he would recognize that and admit that. And, um, you know, aside from some of that conservatism that tends to go along with it, but capitalism solves these problems also better than anything else. Because when you distribute knowledge and labor and free exchange and you use comparative advantage, this, this is what allows those people who have different levels of skills or opportunities to actually participate and contribute value. Um, in any other system where things are kind of organized for you and, and predetermined, um, you don't have the opportunity to, to, to trade your skills uh, and, and things that you can provide. Um, my grocery store right down the street that I really like going to, um, they make a concerted effort to hire um, disabled people. And I really like that because what it shows is um, with these with these they're mostly young people who are working as, you know, they're doing simple jobs like bagging or collecting the grocery carts from the parking lot and all that. They're showing that even people who have low levels of skills, who haven't, who are, who are clearly disadvantaged um, because of, you know, circumstances that weren't even their fault, they can still contribute. And that's an awesome thing. And so when we, when we say, that, well, some people, you know, they just have a hard time and can't contribute. So therefore, we need to do these things for them. Like, well, wait a minute. Um, everyone can do something. If you're, if you're relatively able-bodied, even these, these excellent young people who work at my local grocery store, 
um, they do a great job. They're participating and they deserve the esteem that comes from doing a good job and contributing. And I'm, I'm always happy to, uh, to go to their checkout line when they're working because it's great. So, um, you know, capitalism solves the problem because there's always going to be people who are like, you know what, I don't want to do that job or I don't have time to do it. Um, so I'll just hire someone. Well, that's your opportunity. Go do it for them. Get, start getting paid for it. That's how capitalism works. Everyone can participate. That's the genius of capitalism. Um, that idea goes to something that is maybe the most horrible thing that Sandel writes in this book. I, I really can't believe he writes it. I, I'm going to read it to you because it's so amazing. On, uh, on uh, In the conclusion of the book, he describes the story of the famous baseball player, Hank Aaron, who, you know, was he's one of the greatest baseball players of all time, and he had a really difficult upbringing, and even as an adult, playing uh, baseball because he was an African American in the South in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s when when it was you know very difficult, obviously. And uh, you know, an author who wrote one of his biographies said that you know hitting, being a great hitter and being a great b b ball player was was a an excellent kind of form of meritocracy because. He was able to become great at it. And here's what Sandel says. Uh, he says, it's hard to have that idea without loving meritocracy. That it's a vindication of talent over prejudice and racism and unequal opportunity. And from this thought, it's a, it's a small step to the conclusion that a just society is a meritocratic one, where everyone has a chance to rise as far as their talent and hard work will take them. But this is a mistake, he says. The moral of Henry Aaron's story, and this is just appallingly awful, the moral of Henry Aaron's story is not that we should love meritocracy, but that we should despise a system of racial injustice that can only be escaped by hitting home runs. That is an amazing sentence. That basically... Um, we should not pay attention to his triumphs and the hard work and skill that he exhibited to earn the respect of millions of people across America, despite some people hating him. We should disregard all that because, after all, it would have been better if we had lived in a utopia in the first place. It's like, what an awful thing to say. I really can't believe an intelligent person like that would even say that. That, well, since we don't live in heaven, um, we shouldn't care that people overcome uh, through their own efforts. <laughs> I can't believe, that's just so awful. It's truly, it's kind of hard to imagine. Um, again, what capitalism offers is that what ways of dealing with the evils of humans, such as racism or other forms of of injustice is to develop a system of justice under the law so people don't get harmed, right? I can't go beat you up. That's one way we can help people. That's that's fair for all. We all live by that rule. That's good. And the other way you overcome the evils of the world is free exchange. Exactly what was described about his uh, hitting skills and his meritocracy of utilizing his talents to become successful. Capitalism and true equality under law are the two best things. We already have that. Again, they're not perfect. Mistakes get made. But arguing that, well, we should just live in utopia. And if, if, if we just lived in a perfect world, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. Like, well, yeah, no kidding. Right? Like, uh, that would be called heaven. And, uh, you know, in heaven, yeah, you don't need to overcome things because you're with God and there's no suffering anymore. But until then, we need people to act heroically. And Hank Aaron is a hero because of the obstacles he faced. The real world has challenges in it. And so we need models to follow so that we learn how to overcome them. And so, yeah, Hank Aaron is a true meritocratic hero. So to diminish his accomplishments because you're angry that we haven't created heaven on earth yet is truly a despicable idea. He also says in the conclusion um, that he really would like to promote these public spaces where civic engagement 
can occur, that where people of all backgrounds and, and social levels can come together and talk to one another and participate in the same things and, and develop this sort of social cohesion. And uh, he uses an example of one author who describes that the U.S. Library of Congress is just one of those places, a symbol of what democracy can accomplish on its own behalf, where people, again, can come from all walks of life. And the author says that uh, this is a perfect working out in a concrete example of the American dream, the means provided by the accumulated resources of the people themselves and a public intelligent enough to use them. It's like, okay, you're still, again, ignoring the human nature that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can have all the public spaces you want. It doesn't mean people are going to use them. <laughs> Trust me, I go to the city library twice, once or twice a week. I'm there all the time. I got his book at the public library. So I'm very familiar. I go there constantly. Trust me, the people who are there, most of them, not like me, <laughs> okay, who are, I'm trying to do exactly what he's describing. I'm trying to learn more about the world. I'm trying to engage, engage in the culture and learn more about different types of people. I picked up his book because I was curious about it. Yeah, I'm, I'm who he's aiming at. That's right. You know who's in there? Not people like me. Trust me. Um, so yeah, maybe 5% of people who use these public resources are truly pursuing them with the intent that he's describing and are, are trying to participate in this thing called, you know, civics. But many people don't, you know, this is why we have public education. And how is that working out? The whole thought was, well, if we could just provide schools where everyone would have an opportunity, then things would get better. Yeah, have you seen the levels of our students today who can't read and write and do math? Yeah, how, it's not working. So again, you can't make people do it. You can't make people go to a museum. You can't make people go, go to an art gallery. Like, it's amazing that pe people think that you can just, well, if we just create the right conditions, everything will work out. That's not how it works. That, that was the last few years of, we've got to get, out, get everyone access to Wi-Fi. And a wireless internet, that's the key to really leveling the playing field and giving people the opportunity to, to, to grow and develop. Like, really? You think that's the difference between people? That one, that some people have Wi-Fi? Look what happens when we give everyone Wi-Fi. What do you, what do, you do? Yeah, there's 5% of people who cleverly started an online business or who you know, used it to pursue an increase in their education. Yeah, that, that, there's 5% of people do that. You know what the other 5% of the people do? They watch Netflix, and they play video games, and they post on Instagram. That's what people do with their Wi-Fi. So, again, I don't disagree with these public spaces. I think they can be done privately, but I agree with the intent and the goal of them. Yeah, we need places to bring people together. Got it. Fine. That doesn't mean people are going to do it. And we have plenty of examples where people don't. Because again, it's cultural. You have to choose to pursue things. You can't just magically create an environment where people automatically do what you want. So again, Sandel is really, he's, he's quite naive here in some of his uh, ideas. Um, again, kind of the overarching premise is he sort of, again, starts with this I hypothetical ideal instead of dealing with human nature. And the irony of all of this, I mentioned at the beginning, is that any solution he does offer, which he doesn't have many, and he doesn't have any overarching solution by the end of the book, um, and the ones he does try to give some ideas, he, he, he offers a few like in the job market, a little bit with taxes, a little bit with college admissions. The only way they could be accomplished is through the technocratic model that he spent the first 50 pages criticizing, right? His solutions all require some smart person who no doubt would have to be credentialed to come up with these math equations to just manipulate people in the right way to achieve the results he thinks is best. That's technocracy. And that's the thing he claims to not like because by nature that would be meritocratic. And yet those are the only solutions he can come up with. So... Um, and you know, as anyone with 
any wisdom knows, you know, technocracy when it's carried fully is, it leads to tyranny uh, inevitably because it's a system of just telling people what to do. So this is, this is what kind of where Bauerlein or uh, where Sandel um, falls in line with pretty much everyone else who's um, makes these really bad arguments. He's an ideologue and this is what ideologues do. Again, they, they see something in the world. So there's the is. They manufacture this ought, the way things should be, out of thin air with that, without explaining it, and then basically say, well, these other people should make that happen. They, they should do it. It's like, how about you do it? If you're so smart, you start. How about stop working at Harvard? After all, if you're so upset about the meritocracy that exists at Harvard, you don't have to work there. You could go teach at a community college, teach philosophy classes at community college, where you truly give people who come from diverse backgrounds a chance to learn cool stuff. Go do that. He makes, who, I mean, the average salary at Harvard is like $200,000. So he makes, you know, probably well over that because he's famous. Give your salary away. Or give 90% of it away. If you truly believe what you say and you want to reduce the meritocracy, well, start helping people. If you do that, let me know and I will give you all the credit. But something tells me he doesn't. Again, like these ideologues, it's always, I have an idea and other people should implement it. You know, I'm sure, again, he lives by meritocracy. I'm sure he goes to the best doctor he can find whenever he has to go get a physical or a checkup. I'm sure he has the best accountant he can find, the best lawyer, the best agent who gets his book deals for him and, and television deals for him. I'm sure he goes to the best steakhouses because he's like anyone else. He values excellence and meritocracy and probably even more so because he's super rich. He can value the best even more than the rest of us because after all, we don't have the money to go find the best. We got to make do with what we got. Uh, you know, whatever's nearby that we can afford. He has the choice of everything, and I bet he probably pursues the highest levels because, of course, he does. All right? And his, his idea that people who are from other backgrounds can't succeed, and therefore it's incumbent upon those who are successful to automatically help those below, well, that's, you talk about dignity, that's diminishing those people's dignity. When you say, you're too stupid, you're too, you know, unfortunate, your background wasn't very good, so therefore you can't do anything. That's diminishing dignity. And that's how we treat small children. Because small children, truly, it's not their fault for how things are. That's how we treat them. It's also how people made an excuse for slavery. Right? Oh, those poor African people, they, they just, they wouldn't survive in the real world. You know, they need to come live on the plantation. Let me take care of them because, you know, even if, regardless of the racial component, you know, they're just too primitive. They're too backward. They, they would never make it. And so I'm actually helping them by hiring them to work uh, on my farm. And, uh, you know, I'll give them a place to live and food and I'll take care of them because, you know, they just couldn't make it. Yeah. Talk about lacking dignity. Yeah, this is how you talk about children and slaves. When you say people can't do it, they're not, they're not good enough. Um, that's not a good road to go down, Professor. Uh, I, I, I hope you change your mind on some of these ideas. Um, back to Bauerlein real quick. You know, he asked his student, why is everyone so upset? And uh, he also asked the same question to one of his friends, who is also a, a professor. The professor said, again, one simple line, they need to read more literature. <laughs> and the, re the, the explanation was that behind that was, you need to learn more about how people are. That's what would help you come up with some uh, more interesting and valuable ideas. Not just literature in English. Uh, Mr. Sandel needs to study more psychology, uh, more biology, not just his notions of philosophy, which I, you know, I think he's a bright man with, with philosophy, but he definitely needs more study in economics and not the technocratic kind uh, where people are just pieces on a chessboard that you can manipulate. 
um, needs to study economics from the human choice perspective. Um, all in all, back to the line about literature, he needs to spend more time learning about people, not just ideas, people. That would be very, very helpful. And if he learned about people, he, he might come to how I tend to think about people that, but, you know, any, a very simplistic way of, of finding out who people are is kind of two categories. There's two types of people. Those who say, I'm for the most part in charge of my life. Or the people who say, well, the world just happens to me. Everything is, you know, going to happen whether I want it to or not. So if you believe you have no control, then why would you ever do anything? You, you know, I, I might as well just sit on my couch and, and hope that luck knocks on my front door and gives me a job opportunity or, or brings me whatever I want. Um, whereas the other type of people who say, you know what? Yeah. I'm limited. Um, things don't always go my way, but you know what? I can do something and I'm going to take charge of my life and I'm going to try my best to incrementally advance myself and contribute and, uh, create dignity for myself by being the best I can be. Well, those are the two types of people, people who take charge of their life and people who don't. And we cannot teach this idea that Professor Sandel is offering. The idea that, oh, whatever happens is just luck. You aren't in charge of yourself. Therefore, you know, people need to help you all the time. That is a really bad idea. And if you encounter professors at universities who are offering that, I would strongly encourage you to go somewhere else. So we need... Um, we need excellence. Meritocracy is a good thing. We need excellence, but we also need respect. He's right in that front. We need leaders, people who have earned their positions. We also need followers. We need people to, to you know, kind of fill out the, the rest of the system. We need bosses and employees. We need superstars and role players. We need heroes and supporting characters. There's a place for everyone. Um, you just got to be willing to find your spot where you can where you can be successful. You know, I wish he would be a little bit. He could actually be more polemical in this in his book, and he could do so by specifically targeting a certain group, like directly point at who you who you're actually talking about. That would be a very interesting book that I would I would much prefer to to read. Um, you know, he could devote maybe the whole thing, to just embracing the, the kindness and dignity angle. That might be more useful. Um, certainly be something everyone would agree on. Um, drop the economic stuff. He clearly doesn't know enough to argue with those things. Um, his arguments are just too flimsy on that front. Um, and, you know, call out people for not being more civic-minded, you know. For those people who are wasting their opportunities and not going to libraries and art galleries and museums and other public spaces that he describes, call them out. Now, those people probably wouldn't read your book in the first place, but hey, try it. Try to try to encourage and inspire people to go be a part of things. Instead of just saying, here's what people, you know, if only we had it, then people would. Like, how about you convince them they should? That might be a more powerful argument. So, you know, just to bring it back to Sandella's uh, himself, this isn't supposed to be ad hominem. I'm just giving you a fax here, okay? Michael Sandel went to high school in Pacific Palisades, which is a beautiful, wealthy beach community in, you know, Southern California. He then, he got his PhD at Oxford, was Phi Beta Kappa, which is the most prestigious and selective honor society in the nation, and then has taught at Harvard for 40 years, all right? Even his wife is a professor at Harvard. And according to the Harvard website, I was looking at into his bio. He teaches only basically one class per year. Last year, he didn't even teach a class. And it's a two-hour, two-credit class for one afternoon a week. And again, the average salary at Harvard is $200,000. And again, I'm sure he makes way more than that. So <laughs> by definition, professor, there is no one who has chased credentials and elitism more than you. I, I don't even know if you uh, how much time you've ever even spent with people 
from the working class because you, you don't know you don't have any idea how those people live because for your entire life, at least your entire adult life, you've been in this bubble of technocratic elitism. And you're insanely wealthy for teaching one class. <laughs> you know, um, that's pretty amazing. Yeah, if you believed in your in your uh, distribution of of rewards, um, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of adjuncts and other teachers who teach four to six classes per semester, like most of us do, um, instead of just one class a year and make a quarter million dollars. So, you know, if you want to put your money where your mouth is, I'd, I'd be, I'd love it. You know, let me know because that, that would be awesome. You'd be, you'd set a really great example. And just to describe what working class life is like, just really qu a quick little anecdote. My uh, my wife is um, from a small factory and farming blue collar town in the middle of the country, and she had no money for anything. She wanted to go to college because she, on her own, even though no one around her had ever gone to college or, or had, had finished college, um, thought, no, this is something I think is probably important. I want to, I want to get better at, at life. And so this is a, a step towards that. She, her parents said, oh, yeah, great. Go, you're on your own though. Cause they didn't have any money. So she got no help at all and paid for her four years of college by being a maid, cleaning other people, strangers, filthy, disgusting houses, and using every penny of that to pay for her classwork by herself for four years so she could get her degree. That's, that's what working class people do to try to improve their lives. And then now she owns her own business. She employs two other females who are able to then contribute to their own family's well-being. And she's very successful. She makes a lot more money than I do. And I have my, you know, multiple degrees and position at a university and all this stuff. And she's, she's more successful than I am. And yet by the title of your book, Professor Sandel, you have the nerve to call her a tyrant because she wanted to improve her life and yeah, benefit through her hard work and her efforts from moving from lower working class to being a successful professional. And that's what you think of those people. How dare you, sir? <laughs> How dare you? And shame on you for your horrible, envious, hypocritical, malicious philosophy. It's, it's awful, truly. So he's part of the, you know, he's part of the intellectual class. Uh, again, he's the very technocrat he, he criticizes. Um, you know, my favorite thinker in the world is Thomas Sowell, and he calls intellectuals those who live in the world of ideas. And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, all of us who are teachers, we live in the world of ideas. You know, I'm not exactly um, building skyscrapers or repairing people's cars or, you know, running a business or anything like that. You know, we live in the world of ideas. But the problem, Soul says is those people who try to take their ideas beyond their little realm and force them upon others without usually actually participating in the consequences of those ideas. And that's what Mr. Sandel does. He doesn't actually live by his own ideas. He just wants other people to do them um, without taking responsibility for them himself. And, uh, and usually they're bad ideas. And it's, as George Orwell famously said, you know, there are some ideas so stupid only intellectuals support them. And this book is one of those. It's an idea so dumb that only someone so smart as Professor Sandel would, would think to write it. So ultimately, read Mark Bauerlein's book instead. <laughs> he is a way smarter um, person. He's a better writer, too. Um, it's just a way better book. And uh, his book, The Dumbest Generation Grows Up, again, that's the title, clearly lays out the problems going on in the, in the culture that have been going on for the last you know, 10, 15 years and uh, offers some, some valu valuable ideas for combating them, I would say, um, just from an academic standpoint. Um, and the people he describes in the book, that, that generation of young people who are having a lot of problems today, 
They're the ones taught by p- teachers like Sandell at schools like Harvard and elsewhere. So if you're a parent or a student and you want a better education than what Sandell would offer you, let me know and I will try to help you. Shoot me an email and I'll do what I can for you. That's all I have. Thanks for listening. If I've made any mistakes, let me know in the comments below. Catch you next time on English Champion.